I'm Stan Hoffman representing the Quarter Minute Era Chamber of Commerce tonight and on behalf of the Chamber, welcome to Candidates Night. Uh, on behalf of the Chamber, welcome to Candidates Night. We have a treat for you tonight. I'm not going to be your moderator. Uh, we got a good one this year, Mr. Dick Spotswood. And, um, we have four wonderful candidates, and I'm so proud of all four of them for their dedication to our community. We live in the best town ever, anywhere, and, and really I want to give all of our candidates so much thanks and admiration for, for, for taking good care of our town. Uh, Bob Ravazio, uh, as you all know, uh, was in an accident, and. Um, Bob is expected to make a full recovery, but um, we have the next best thing, and we have Diane first. And, and, and Diane, uh, Diane is going to read Bob's opening and closing statements, and Diane will respond to Bob's uh, the three predetermined questions. Uh, I think I've said enough. I'd like to turn it over to Dick Spotswood, and, and let's welcome him. Thank you, Dick. Thank you. Well, also, congratulations to you folks for coming out on such a beautiful night, doing your civic duty and listening to four people who uh, have uh, put, their, uh, put themselves on the line. This is the uh, classic small town event. Uh, it is uh, American democracy, how it's supposed to work. Doesn't always work perfectly, but it works pretty good here in small towns. Let me tell you a little bit about the format tonight and the ground rules. Uh, the uh, four folks here are well aware of the ground rules, but uh, it's important that you understand as well. Uh, each candidate will make a two-minute introductory speech. We start in alphabetical order and then we're going to shift throughout the night so everybody gets a chance to be first in responding to questions. Uh, each candidate will respond to each question with each answer confined to no more than one and a half minutes each. We have a timekeeper here who's in the first row who will remind them when they exceed the one and a half minutes. There's extra points if they don't do one and a half minutes, a little shorter is, is, is always recognized by the audience favorably, so uh, a thought there. Uh, and each candidate will make a two-minute wrap-up speech. The formal part of the program tonight is going to end at 8.30, so you're not going to be here all night, so there's a, there's a time limit on this. If you folks have questions for specific candidates, we invite you to write them down, and they'll be collected. Uh, we encourage you to make those questions uh, available to all candidates. In other words, direct them to all candidates rather than simply candidate A, because each candidate is going to have a chance to respond to every question. The candidates will not be bopping and weaving. I've told them they each have the option of standing or being seated when they answer the question. Uh, our camera crew here is uh, able to accommodate that, uh, and so that will work uh, as it should. Um, we're going to ask you to limit the questions tonight to issues of which the Corte Madera Town Council or the city, a town of Corte Madera has some control rather than uh, the Israeli-Palestine dispute. Uh, time constraints, uh, we said uh, limit them to one and a half uh, minutes, but let me ask you that if you can, to the best of your ability, uh, make your questions succinct because somebody's going to read them and uh, uh, they would be grammatical and uh, we could do it quite easily. Uh, try to avoid and answers, uh, try to avoid multi-part questions. Um, that's pretty much it. Bob Bravasio, as you know, is on the road to recovery, which is great news, uh, but he will not be here tonight. Uh, Diane First, the Vice Mayor of Cornbarra, will be uh, making the opening statement for him. And as uh, you've been told, we'll answer the first three questions. She will then step down and not participate, uh, because who knows what Bob's answers would be, uh, into the questions that come after that. But she will come back and, and do a clothing statement that Bob has prepared. Uh, I think we pretty much have, oh, please, if you can, do silence your cell phones. Uh, always helps, especially to the, to the candidates. Um, there's the nothing worse than getting reminded that you have a uh, dentist appointment tomorrow morning. So let's start off. Are you all folks, everybody understand the ground rules? Audience, does everybody understand the ground rules? Make sense? Okay, let's go. Uh, we're going to start in, uh, as we said, uh, uh, an order which is going to uh, uh, make some sense here. And Eli Beckman, blessed with the letter B to start off, will answer the first question. Eli. Oh, that's well, first of all, you'll make the first uh, opening statement. Okay, exactly. Great. Please, Eli. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank the Chamber for hosting this event and all of you who are in attendance for taking the time to come here. Uh, my name's Eli Beckman. I'm a lifelong resident of Corte Madera. I grew up in our fantastic local public schools, went to Neil Cummins, 
Hall Redwood uh, before graduating from Cal Poly School of Architecture. I'm now working with Perkins Eastman in San Francisco and living back in the community. Uh, once I came back to the community after graduating, I spoke to a neighbor of mine who's been involved with the town for a long time, Bob Bundy, how I could get involved as well, and he suggested that I apply for a position on the Flood Control Board. I'll tell you that serving on the Flood Control Board has been a privilege and an honor for me, and it's also opened the door to further involvement, which has been really great. Uh, I joined our local chapter of the Lions Club, to which I've just been elected a director, which is a, a great honor. And I'm also an incident commander uh, in my neighborhood's neighborhood response group, uh, helping advance our neighborhood towards greater public safety. I'm running for town council now because I see a moment of opportunity for our town. This is the first time since the recession that we're on solid enough footing to invest in our own future. And I want to see us seize that opportunity by renewing our commitment to responsible governance and taking advantage of new and emerging technologies to make local government more transparent, effective, efficient, and accessible to all members of our community. Second, I want to help prepare Corte Madera for the online retail era. This is going to have an outsized impact on both the local economy and our town's finances, and I think we need to move now to get out ahead of that. And finally, we must act now to prepare our town for the worst effects that climate change will have. Climate change is going to threaten our town with increasingly severe flooding and wildfires, and I believe it's critical that we move now to do everything we can to mitigate those impacts. If elected, I will dedicate myself to taking a long-term view of these issues and the others that face our town. And I look forward to a great discussion tonight. Thank you. Eli Beckman, thank you. David Kunhart. Good evening, everybody. My name is David Kunhart. When I choose a town council member, there are two things that I look for, experience and values. As to values, mine include respect, empathy, and the ability to listen. They also include a deep appreciation for the due process that our Constitution affords us. I also value science as the starting point of any public policy inquiry, ethical practice in the middle, and fair and equitable solutions for all in the end. As to experience, I've worked for over 30 years uh, creating community partnerships. No one up, else up here can say this, even Bob. In government, I served three years in the Office of International Affairs at HUD in Washington, DC. Later in Needham, Massachusetts, near where I was born, I chaired a design review board and a school renovation committee, and I was elected to the planning board in that town of 29,000, all during the time that I worked for the Community Builders, a nonprofit. We came here 22 years ago in 1996. And during my decade with Transamerica, I was active in the national peer group of community investors serving as a mentor and as its president in 2003. In 2008, after I finished with that work, I was appointed to the Marin Workforce Housing Trust, served on it for five years, three of those as chair. I've worked in solar energy now for 11 years. I was co-founder of the Coalition for a Livable Marin. I'm on the board of the Environmental Forum of Marin, the Marin chapter of CCL, that is Citizens Climate Lobby, and I helped the time to lead on Climate Coalition since 2013. So we've been here 22 years. I've been on the Christmas Tree Hill Dwellers Board for 19 years, three of those as its president, in the Lions Club for six years, and two of those as president. I think it's time ready for me, for me to say I'm ready. Thank you. David Kunhart, thank you. <laughs> Valeria Sasser. Good evening. My name is Valeria Sasser, and it's an honor to be here tonight with you. I'm running for town council because I believe I can bring a feminine look to the council since the two colleagues are leaving. <laughs> and um, with perspectives, with new perspectives, without forgetting the town history and what makes us love this so much. Uh, to be effective, the new council must think and plan, plan proactively on our, all issues, asking the right questions to receive and to reach the best solutions. Corte Madeira is in solid financial ground now. And, but it has issues that we need to address anyway in the short term. 
like a um, disaster preparedness, including rainwater, tide flooding, and fire, infrastructure maintenance and improvements, workforce and elderly housing, and preservation of our rental stock, and the triad traffic, transportation, transit improvement. I want to create more opportunities for us to build community continuously. I find it is missing here a little bit. Inform to improve the town government's transparency and efficiencies and to support steady and long-term sources of revenue, such as the Measure F. We chose Corte Madeira when we visited it for the first time and finally in 2011 we had a chance to move in. I enjoy everything about this town and I will work to ensure all residents continue to enjoy the same feeling I do. And I, I'm pretty sure you all share. I've been knocking on doors and that's what I have been finding. Through my 16 years in public service, I noticed that what the public values more is a genuine care. And I do care. Care comes, comes from within. The knowledge, the skills, and the ability we are able to acquire anytime. So I count on you to inform me as well to help me in my learning process. I'm almost ready. Honor me with your vote on June 5th, and let's work together. Thank you. Valerie Sasser, thank you. Diane first, speaking on behalf of Bob Robasio. Thank you. I saw Bob today. He looks really good. I think you'll all be pleased that he's making a terrific recovery. Uh, the doctor's prognosis is that he will be making a full recovery with no long-term health impacts. And I know that Bob is very excited to get back to work uh, and service to this town. Um, I wanted to mention that the statements I'll be reading tonight are from Bob. They are not mine. Uh, there are a few printouts of the statements if you all want to actually read them. There's some copies on the table in the side room. Um, so here goes. Bob Ravazio, current council member and former mayor, has been a strong believer in service to our community since he and his wife relocated to Corte Madera 27 years ago because it offered small town ambiance near an urban center. He is committed to our community its small town character, strong values, caring residents, and good schools. He is prepared to protect and enhance our community by working to maintain the attributes that brought each of us here. Deep community involvement and active participation in community organizations have given him the breadth of experience needed for Corte Madera to continue to thrive and maintain its quality of life and small town atmosphere. There are many important issues and priorities to be addressed over the next few years on behalf of our town and its residents. Bob's command of town finances, his knowledge of local sentiments, and the needs of various areas of our community are valuable assets to our town council. Bob's effective leadership is acknowledged throughout our community. Please vote to retain Bob Ravazio on June 5th. Diane, first, thank you for uh, ably representing Bob Ravasio. We're now going to start the uh, three questions that uh, have been presented to the candidates in advance. This is a good time to point out to you that if you uh, are in the mind of writing the questions, they're uh, prepared to, or Julie's prepared to pick them up and uh, start to assemble them. So uh, raise your hand and she will get them. Let's start with the uh, first question. And uh, just so we know, uh, David, you'll start off this time because uh, Eli had the uh, honor to go first. In your opinion, what are the most important issues facing Corte Madera, and how do you intend to address them? Thank you very much. Okay. Um, four quick ones. Uh, sea level rise, supporting schools, emergency preparedness, and sound fiscal management. Those are the four things that are most important uh, and I think are uh, the things that all of us are going to need to address. Sea level rise obviously affects 40, the 40% 40 of our town that was built on wetlands and will be uh, an increasing challenge. Fortunately, we have Measure F on the ballot, and I think all of us have stepped forward and supported Measure F. Uh, I'm going to leave the explanation of that to Todd or to the, uh, additional questions. Um, supporting schools. You know, in my experience, the thing that brought most folks here to Corte Madera and, and to Larkspur is our school district and our, our, the wonderful quality of our schools. And 
that is the foundation of a lot of the community that we uh, celebrate, is those, uh, those school communities. Uh, not all of the safe routes to school have been completed. Uh, we need to make sure we keep our crossing guards, we, that uh, we uh, fund yellow buses, uh, particularly in the whole Tiburon uh, Peninsula. Emergency preparedness, uh, I too have been working on uh, CERT and on uh, the uh, Get Ready 94925, uh, was one of the trainers for two years in that, uh, and I'm now uh, on the steering committee on Christmas Tree Hill. Yeah, the fires this fall put us all on alert. We have to really uh, step up on that. And we'll talk about sound fiscal management later because I'm at the end. Thank you, David. Valeria. Huh? Valeria. In my opinion, uh, the three most pressing issues in Corte Madeira are disaster preparedness for both flood and fire on the hills. If anything happened, we are all going to be affected regardless where we live. So it will be chaotic traffic, we will be troubles with electricity and clean water, so it's our problem, it's not a problem of someone that lives here or another one that lives over there. We must work together in the disaster groups and asking the right questions. Do we have a way to ingress and egress routes from the hills? How are the trucks going to pass? Do we have places for that? Uh, housing is a problem. We need to have housing. But what we have to preserve is the rental stock we have here. Uh, is that being addressed? How can we prevent some units that of our current stock of being going into Airbnb? I don't know. I have a few, a few ideas about that. Is the transient tax uh, an option? We don't, have, we don't have a regulation in Cort Madeira about that. So it could be an, an option. It's important that we have options in this. And uh, the transportation traffic and transit, I already have 15 seconds. Transportation traffic and transit triad, which is complicated and we do not connect the both sides of town. We must take care of that. Plus the roads need frequent maintenance in the areas where it was marsh before. So my time is up. Well, our assessor, thank you. Uh, Diane first will be reading the uh, answers that Bob Probasio provided after he had a chance to read the question. Diane. Thank you. Corte Madeira is a community with outstanding local services and schools and beautiful surroundings that brought each of us here. For the town to thrive and maintain its quality of life, several important issues should be addressed over the next few years on behalf of the town and its residents. These are the important issues and priorities which the town must stay focused on. One, maintain essential town services by improving fire prevention, flood control, and other crucial town infrastructure. Number two, promote safe shared use by pedestrians, cyclists, and autos through street improvement projects. Three, ensure disaster preparedness through comprehensive planning for public safety and restoration of essential services. Four, support energy conservation and sustainable infrastructure projects. And five, provide services and programs to enhance residents' quality of life. Addressing these important issues and priorities require adequate funding. An important step recently taken by the town is that the June election will have on its ballot Measure F to protect Corte Madera's safety and quality of life. Corte Madera relies heavily on sales tax revenue to protect and maintain the town. The passage of Measure F will provide greater funding. Bob supports exploring ways to cut costs and improve services, including through consolidations, such as the Central Marin Police and Central Marin Fire. We must plan for capital projects, and we must stay focused on achieving measurable results to protect and enhance our town. Thank you, Diane. Eli Beckman, please. Well, it seems clear to me that climate change is the most pressing issue facing Corte Madera. It's certainly not the only issue our town faces, but it's the only issue that actually threatens our way of life. As David touched on, one third of our town is in a floodplain at current sea levels, and yet every time a new sea level rise report comes out, we see that this problem is accelerating faster than we had anticipated. Uh, climate change is also going to threaten us with more frequent and severe wildfires, and together, flooding and wildfire are going to threaten our private property, our homes, our businesses, and also our critical public infrastructure, like our freeways. I think the uh, short-term response to that is to continue investing in flood control, 
uh, and fire safety initiatives as we have been doing. But I think that the long-term solution is to begin planning now, uh, taking a much longer-term view of this issue than we've traditionally done in this town. I think we need to be looking uh, 50 to 100 years out to plan what's going to happen when sea level is up by four, five, six feet. Uh, second big issue facing Cordon Madera, I think, as I said, is the online retail era. Cordon Madera is pretty unique among Marin County towns in that we rely so heavily on sales tax revenue. Uh, and the shift of retail online is really going to have a, an outsized impact on our sales tax revenue. And it's also uh, really going to be a struggle for local businesses to stay competitive. So I think it's critical that we support local businesses as they innovate with their business models to try and stay competitive in this new era. I also think we need to develop a contingency plan as a community to say, what is our alternative tax structure going to be if sales tax revenue is no longer able to fund the services that we as Corte Madarans want? Finally, the most immediately apparent problem that we all face are all of the uh, impacts of this, this flaming regional economy we've got here that leads to huge pressure on Corte Madera to grow, immense traffic, soaring home prices. Uh, this is not a problem that we can just build our way out of, but I think it's critical that Corte Madera plays an integral role working with other municipalities to address this issue. Thank you. Eli Beckman, thank you. Second question. And, uh, uh, Valeria Sasser will uh, start off this time. And the question is, recent projects and developments have produced very strong differences of opinion within our community. Going forward, what changes in the review process would more effectively accommodate the diverse opinions of our residents and still preserve our small town character? Valeria. You, you have, we have to talk. The communication must to be <laughs> intense, and that's the main problem with the review processes. Um, I find it disconnected in, in, in a few aspects, but the timing is also complicated. So you, you take about six months to receive an approval or a denial, and then you just can apply again a year after. One year and a half to continue with, the, with all your plans and everything you have to do. So about the review process. The question is about the review process, not all about all the past developments that we have in the recent projects. So I, my two options for that would be improving communication, let's talk. I don't think it's, the, the two ways not clear enough and strong enough. We can improve that, certainly we can. And the second thing is let's re-evaluate the times for all this, this process, the review process mainly. If an appeal illogical comes up, we still can postpone for two months just for listening to that. So I, I think we can work as a community much better on this. Thank you, Valeria. Diane, would you uh, be kind enough to read to Bob's response? Thank you. Successful projects that accommodate diverse opinions need transparency, including strong outreach to the community, a study process, and clear objectives. Outreach takes full transparency about any changes or additions being considered and the steps to be taken to reach objectives. A study process that includes public workshops is needed to assess current conditions, discuss any development constraints, address community's vision, and analyze opportunities. Objectives must clearly state what is hoped to be accomplished. Objectives that lead to successful planning implementation with support of residents, business and property owners, and other stakeholders must be responsive and representative of the community's vision, set forth policies that reflect and support the character of an area, and be consistent with the Corte Madera general plan and housing element. The process followed for the Tamil Vista Corridor Study is a good example which led to community-supported recommendations for both the short and long term. Our town's small town character must be preserved when contemplating any changes or additions. Not everyone will always be pleased with the changes or additions to our town. However, everyone should be informed about potential changes and have the opportunity to participate in the discussion. Thank you, Diane. Eli? Well, I am pleased to say that there have already been substantial changes, improvements to our planning process since the Tam Ridge residences were constructed. Uh, we've got new and extremely professional planning staff at our uh, planning department right now. Uh, that's going to help us a lot going forward. 
Uh, there are also now more public workshops as part of the planning process, which is, I think, a critical improvement that was maybe lacking somewhat uh, in the run-up to the Tamridge residences. Uh, and I, I do feel that uh, in a lot of ways, the Tamridge residences was, I think, a lesson that you only have to learn once. I think the community was very clear uh, in their reaction to that project and their assessment, uh, how they felt about it. So I, I do think that going forward, we have a much clearer understanding as a community of what we want to see here and what feels right to us. That said, I think there's always more work to be done in facilitating even greater public awareness of the planning process. I think that we, as I touched on earlier, should embrace uh, technology to help notify residents when there are really major noteworthy projects beginning or proceeding through the planning process. Uh, and I am certainly committed to helping us continue taking steps in that direction if elected. Thank you. Eli Beckman, thank you. David Kunhart. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to take a moment to talk about small town character and what it is that we value about that. Because I submit that it is not directly related to the shape of the physical environment that we have. And I will try to prove that tonight. Small town character to me means the school communities, the PTAs, the soccer teams, the Girl Scouts, your uh, poker club, your bridge club, the women's club, the uh, the Lions Club, to be sure, uh, the Bridge Club, the, the book clubs. My wife has a book club at her house, at our house right uh, now. Those are the small town qualities that we value most, is the interaction, the human interactions that we have. Um, I think the question is an error in another respect, in saying what would we do to the review process. The review process is too late. I think uh, both... Bob's response and Eli have already mentioned this in a sense of what is a workshop? A workshop is an opportunity to come together way in advance of any project under review. It's a chance to come together and say, what do we value? What do we want? What do we see in this area, in that area? And let's shape it. Now, let me put some real visuals on what I mean. Larkspur, downtown Larkspur to me is the most beautiful small town, physical small town character. There, in downtown Larkspur, it's up to 30 units to the acre. I'm suggesting we have 20 units to the acre as our max standard here in Corte Madera. Thank you. Thank you, David. The uh, next question, uh, which we're going to start, uh, Diane, uh, and uh, Bob's answer would be first on this one. What are your thoughts on low-cost housing, workforce housing, and senior housing? Do you support them? And how would you reach, reach consensus on a solution? Thank you. Corte Madera supports sustainable growth through proper planning. It is one of, Corte Madera is only one of 12 cities in the entire state to meet targeted regional housing needs assigned by ABAG, the Association of Bay Area Governments. Because of our success, we are not required to streamline government approvals for multifamily housing. That does not mean more work must not be done. We continue to explore ideas, all of which must be addressed transparently and with public input. Some steps Corte Madera has taken, creating a new mixed-use district to integrate higher density multifamily residential housing with commercial use, and simplifying the process for new second units, which will not only add housing, but can give needed income for retirees to remain in their homes. Bob would also like to see affordable workforce housing made available using current housing stock. For example, assistance to low and moderate income home buyers through down payment assistance similar to Napa County's Proximity Housing Home Buyers Assistant Loan Program, which helps buyers buy homes within 15 miles of their workplaces. This reduces commutes and greenhouse gases. Homelessness is best addressed as a countywide issue, and Bob Ravazio currently represents Corte Madera on the County Homeless Committee working to find the best ways to serve the growing population and to provide funding and other services. Thank you, Diane. Uh, Eli, please. I strongly support more equitable housing opportunities here in Corte Madera. I think there's no doubt that the region, the state, 
are really in a huge housing crisis. Uh, we have longtime residents being displaced from Corte Madera. There's nowhere for fixed income seniors to go. Uh, many of our public servants are forced to live far out of town. I will tell you from my personal experience, I'm a young professional. Uh, the affordable units at the Tamridge residences, a 600 square foot studio for me would start at $2,000 a month. I qualify for their second to most discounted tier of apartment and it is $2,000 a month for 600 square feet. We have a lot of work to do in order to get a little more economic diversity in our community. I think that's really critical. Uh, I, this is not a crisis that Cord Madera can just build its way out of, as I said, but I do think uh, the response is regional because the problem is regional, and we have to play an integral role in working with all of our neighboring municipalities, not just to fix the market conditions here, but also to lobby Sacramento and even Washington to fix policy glitches that they may have that are exacerbating this crisis. Thank you. Eli, thank you. David? We specifically in Marin had a 23% increase in housing cost in the last year alone. 23% in housing cost. It's really, it's tough for folks. I uh, support high quality affordable housing, workforce housing, senior housing, and junior accessible accessory uh, dwelling units. When Rachel Guinness, who is the founder of Lilypad Homes, came forward with that idea, she asked me to be on her in informal advisory panel, which I did, and I encouraged her strongly, and I said, you know, this idea is going to go far. And in fact, it has. It's gone all the way to the state, and the state has encouraged towns all across uh, the state to allow junior accessory dwelling units with uh, few, less fees, uh, lowering fees. Now, um, <clears throat> One of the things that we haven't especially done is balanced the tremendous number of jobs in town with the uh, uh, supply of units. I noticed on next door in my neighborhood a year ago, somebody put out, uh, can somebody give me a reference for, some, for a person who can clean my home? And there were two dozen wonderful references to a Latina with an area code on her contact telephone of 707 or... Uh, 510. That is who is helping us. And all of those comments were, you will love this person. They are so trustworthy. They're so wonderful. They should be part of our community. If they're so trustworthy and wonderful, they really should be able to be a part of our community and round out the economy in our housing stock. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Valeria. All right. I was very simplistic in my first answer, so if you want to continue the conversation, I'm available after <laughs> this whole thing is the structured discussion. Is, but here we go, for housing. I want the town to embrace all residents from all walks of life. That include the renters and entry level service professionals. We, we need housing, as every single town and city in California, but we have a lot to consider on that. Above all, we need to preserve our rental stock and make sure affordable means affordable. Affordable for the elderly, affordable for the, the uh, teachers, for those in entry level uh, positions. Nobody starts from the top. Most people start right there, making little money, needs to leave. It's one main need everybody has. So I have a few ideas, like the Park Madeira Center, we can add one or two stores there and have more housing. Sure, we can. But that control must be under town management because we must make that affordable, true affordable. We cannot have uh, developers come into the city and make the $5,000 rent, a $6,000 rent like in the Tam Ridge residence, that does not serve us. How someone in a fixed income elderly will pay for that? We can talk about that, a whole bunch of things on this. And also we must make sure that the infrastructure is, for, it, it is able to have the new residents. Are the teachers, student ratio in the schools going to be highly affected? Do we have a room to grow? And much more issues. Thank you, Valeria. That uh, ends the three questions that uh, have, were pre-selected and will be given to all the candidates. Diane's now going to step down uh, because uh, the other questions are unknown to the speaker, so it wouldn't be proper for uh, uh, Bob would have no way of knowing the answers. 
uh, but Diane will be back representing Bob's closing position uh, at the time at the end of the, uh, of the forum. Let's go on to th three questions, uh, or a bunch of questions actually, folks, and you haven't heard these before, so we'll see what your response is. I'm going to get back in the order now that Diane stepped down, and I'm going to start with Eli, uh, uh, David, and then Valeria, and then we'll keep rotating from there. Question. Core Madera faces, faces an annual budget drain paying for current employee pensions and its unfunded town employee pension liability. Is the town's current approach adequate? And if not, what are your suggestions for addressing this dilemma? Eli. I've been quite proud to see the steps that the town has taken so far in addressing the crisis of unfunded liabilities with regards to our pensions. Uh, I'll give you one example of that. We were previously paying into two different pension funds. One of those pension funds is now nearing full funding, and uh, the town is planning not to cease making those payments once that fund is fully funded, but rather instead to continue making those payments and instead of putting them into this fund, setting them aside to prepare for, for example, other unfunded liabilities or other expenses that may come down the road. I think that's a great example of the sort of common sense fiscal responsibility that we need to continue and further advance in our town. I think it's gonna serve our community really well. Thank you. It's definitely a tough issue, and uh, one that fortunately our town manager is handling as well as any town manager in Marin, in, in my view. Um, we are not as burdened as some other communities on this, but we have already taken steps to change initial hire policies. We have as well uh, a higher ratio that is being paid in by employees in our fire department and our police departments than uh, is expected under state law. Uh, so we actually have a, quite a good balance of uh, solutions that have already been implemented. It, obviously, it's something that we need to keep our eye on. It's also something that we could use help on with other communities around us and collaboration with other communities around us as all of us are faced with this same uh, particular dilemma. At the same time, we, we're, in, we're about $500,000 in the black here, and we have a, a good fiscal uh, situation in Corte Madera, so we can't lend that out to our neighbors, but we definitely need to collaborate on the solutions on all unfunded liabilities. Thank you. Thank you, David. Valeria? I'm going to repeat what the colleague said, because the situation doesn't change in five minutes. So, yes, we are in good uh, situation. I sat down with... Uh, our town manager, Todd Cusimano, and he showed how the, his funding, how he will continue to put money in the fund that is going on. Some of the, st the employees in town are paying into their liabilities, future liabilities as, as well. And as a public employee myself, I fully understand the other side of the question. So learning from Todd uh, gave me a different perspective, and I'm very pleased with what I saw. Thank you. Next question, and David, we're going to start with you on this one. Uh, and I'm going to combine two questions uh, into one because it's the same topic. Uh, where does disaster preparedness fall on your priority chart? And most of the North Bay, including Corner Madera, faces the danger of out-of-control wildland fire similar to the one that devastated Santa Rosa. What additional steps do you suggest be taken to safeguard Corner Madera residents? David Kunhart. Well, as a resident of Christmas Tree Hill, this one has been very much uh, a high priority on my own uh, list and was one of the reasons when it uh, when in uh, neighborhood response team started to come forward, thanks to Lee and John Howard uh, and their fabulous efforts in this across the Twin Cities, uh, I stepped up and said, okay, I'll be a block captain, okay, I'll be on the steering committee, I'll help you out and, and we will try to make things happen. But starting 20 years ago when I first moved here, uh, we were aware that uh, particularly earthquake and construction uh, was a, a major uh, issue. So there's um, changes that we've made in the uh, building code as a result of uh, those considerations that probably needs to be stepped up and advanced uh, a little further. I think the town should be budgeting a modest amount of money each year towards staffing the uh, organization of disaster preparedness uh, across both of our um, largely united communities right here. 
Uh, and then we need to start getting to work on actual implementation of removal of some of that fabulous overburden of uh, trees and bushes that are up um, in our environment uh, and uh, start talking frankly with one another when you see that your neighbor is not doing their job of, uh, of trimming out what they ought to and, and perhaps endangering your property. Uh, so these are going to be a number of uh, conversations that we will all have to have as well as town support. Thank you. I have had wonderful conversations about this topic of the topic of fire um, in these past weeks. Yes, I live in the bottom of the, court, the Christmas tree hill, and I'm very worried about that, specifically about the trees that are, conduct fire very easily, like the eucalyptus and the bay, bay, bay laurel. And um, I'm worried about a few other issues on, on the fire, specifically on the hills. We have the open space. The open spaces can um, travel, the fire can travel really fast on this open space. Who are taking care of those? Who are, is, we need a lot more than just the defensible, defensible space in between the houses. Um, how, how are the routes? Can the trucks, are the trucks small enough to go in the hills? Can they reach the house? Why is the, the next house, if the trucks come all the way to my house, the next house is just as important. And we must work together, the, the town agencies with the neighborhood groups and be a strong partnership on fire prevention, specifically about the fire prevention. And uh, for the, part, the first part of the question was how disaster preparedness is in my priority chart, very high. I recognize that Hillside Corte Madera is at extreme risk for a wildfire. Uh, it's a really high priority of mine, and I suspect that's one of the reasons that I was honored with the endorsement of the Marin Professional Firefighters. Uh, I've had some really great discussions with our fire chief, Scott Schertz, and some of his firefighters as well about what we can do. And as I understand it, there's a lot more work to be done when it comes to public outreach, uh, making sure that people are aware of and complying with all of the fire marshal's guidelines, for example, maintaining defensible space around their homes, and not just trimming it when the fire marshal comes and yells at you, but actually maintaining that defensible space year-round. Uh, we also need to get more people enrolled in our emergency alert system. The town has uh, a parallel alert system to the county system, but I think a lot of residents are unaware of that uh, and are therefore not enrolled, so that's another place where we can make uh, some real improvements. Uh, finally, I would like to see the town look at potentially more creative ways uh, to make our community more fire resistant. Maybe there's things, w steps we can take in order to incentivize construction with fire resistant materials. I think these are the sort of approaches that we should explore together as a community to see how we can keep ourselves safe as climate change makes fires more frequent and more ferocious. Thank you. Thank you, Eli. Uh, we're going to start this time with... Uh, Valeria, uh, Valeria, how would you, and this is a housing question, how would you address the state mandates that provide for various income levels and where they can go? Would you repeat? Yes, it's a, a, not 100% clear to me either. Uh, would you, how would you address the state mandates, and I'm presuming they're talking about for affordable housing, uh, that provide for various income levels in housing? And how would you determine where that housing would go? Where the housing would go? In who, town. Who asked the question, where Not the house would go? <laughs> well, we are talking about our town. And about the mandate income levels, usually the income levels are the, the county of Marini, which are oddly high. So whatever the state levels and the federal levels are, are a lot lower than the income levels we have here in, in the county of Marin. For several services, we have to use that one, and housing would be that. My issue before, if you remember, I said that should be town controlled for affordability because we can assure that it's according to our own standards. We don't, wouldn't, there, there are ways of doing that locally that wouldn't have to do if it's private or if it's state. 
So, but the housings, where it would go? Would go here, right? <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure I understood, but I'm, let's talk and we, we can do better on this. I, I'm, I'm not sure I understood the question. That's why we want you to write legible questions. <laughs> Eli, I think the gist of the question is, I'm going to try to put it aside and come up with what I think the person is asking, where should affordable housing go? So I think state mandates uh, with regards to affordable housing, uh, sometimes, especially in the instances of the uh, most recent bills we've seen from our dear Senate, uh, state senator, Scott Weiner, have been a little heavy-handed. Uh, I think affordable housing is definitely critical to the values of our community. We care about fairness and inclusivity, uh, but I think the question of where they go needs to be a, a community decision, uh, not something that's mandated by the state. I can tell you personally, I believe that there's no, there's no wrong place for affordable housing in our community, and I think that that is part of being fair, is making sure that you're not segregating your community by income. Uh, I think that it's really important, and I think we can do this by incentivizing, for example, the creation of junior units, uh, which provide an alternate income stream for homeowners, but also provide a stock of presumably somewhat lower, lower cost housing. Uh, I think these are strategies that are going to be important to us to achieve our goals of economic inclusivity and fairness. Thank you. Eli, thanks. David, uh, same interpretation of the uh, question. Yeah, uh, I because I, th I think there's some, uh, perhaps a little bit of misunderstanding there. We actually, uh, even though under the California Constitution, all land use is a state law uh, right, we have fortunately devolved that responsibility to all the communities that are competent to step up and say what they want to do with respect to planning and zoning. That is, communities of a size like ours that have professional staff. And so we can make every determination of where uh, new properties go. Um, as to um, the levels of income, it's extremely rare <laughs> that a government agency will say, well, you need to put levels of income in certain places in your town. It just it doesn't happen. However, what we have is a real shortage of affordable housing. Uh, it's about, there's about 180,000 units needed in the Bay Area, and uh, about 80,000 have been built in the last several years. It's a, uh, it is a situation of real shortage. Fortunately, the mandate on Marin is very light-handed. Uh, Marin has 3.5% of the population of the Bay Area. It has only about 1.5% of the uh, so-called RENA that is regional housing needs analysis uh, uh, target for affordable homes in, in the county of Marin. Uh, so, uh, and I, I agree actually, Scott Wiener's uh, two bills have been sidelined. Uh, the most onerous one of them has been taken off the table for a year. The next one uh, was, had a hearing today and I'd like to know uh, what happened in that hearing. We have more to learn. I believe the uh, um, uh, SB 828 was put on the suspense file. In the sp also? Okay. So 827 is definitely off yeah. the table. Yeah. I, I just got an email before the 828 is on okay. the suspense file. Um, next question. This one uh, will start with uh, Eli. I think it'll be a little clearer. <laughs> in my in my uh, uh, apologies for the uh, whoever wrote that. Eli, please cite the top three priorities for infrastructure improvements and how you propose to pay for them, infrastructure improvements within the town of Cordomadera. Okay. I think, uh, A, I think one of our biggest uh, infrastructure needs going forward is going to continue to be flood control infrastructure. Uh, as we've touched on repeatedly, one third of the town is in a floodplain at current sea levels, and we know that sea level rise is only going to continue. Uh, our flood control needs are going to increase significantly in the years going forward, and that's absolutely going to be a critical priority for us to stay on top of. Two, we know that traffic is a, a serious issue around here, and I think that there's going to require an investment on our part in uh, better traffic control infrastructure, better transit infrastructure, and I think that ties really into my third uh, infrastructure priority, which is better public transit. I think there's a, a lack of credible public transit, uh, not just in Corn Madera, in, in Marin County at large, and I think that is something that we need to all, all of these Mar Marin County communities need to work together uh, to address those issues. Uh, I'm really 
pleased to see Measure F on the ballot. I think that's going to be a critical source of funding uh, for us to address these infrastructure needs going forward. I look forward to supporting Measure F, uh, and I think it, that's going to be a really critical step for us to fund these infrastructure improvements. Thank you. Eli, thank you. David? Not very different. I'm going to sound repetitive, uh, and so I will add completely to what Eli just said, and then I would also add another one. Uh, some of our hillside roads have been a little too neglected, uh, and they're, I don't know if the last time you drove to the top of Christmas Tree Hill, but it's a little scary in some places. <laughs> and, uh, and so we're going to, I think we're going to need for the sake of um, first responder uh, uh, confidence and so forth, we're going to need a little bit of work up there. Uh, but there's another potential uh, which actually a group of citizens have come forward with is uh, maybe we should look at undergrounding utilities. And they've written a uh, very good letter to the, uh, our, our local utility on this topic. I think I actually think that's going to come right back to us and we're going to have to start thinking about how we might raise money, how we might do that in a, in a bonding perhaps. Uh, but fortunately, Measure F will provide an additional several hundred thousand dollars a year, which if we don't spend immediately on uh, levies and uh, pumping and so forth, we will have in a savings account that can be addressed, can be used to address uh, the improvement of uh, clearing our town of excess water when the tide rises and the rain falls. I'm going to stop there. Thank you, David. Larry. Okay. About the infrastructure, um, since two-thirds of the city is in the floodplains, of course the flood uh, infrastructure must be taken care of. But the Measure F will provide the necessary funds. We The, the town has a robust plan on placing the pipes, which is in their 20-year-old, uh, all expiring the floodgates and making sure the, drain, the, the drainage system is working properly. So this is one of them. The second is the sewage, the old earthware um, pipes needs to be replaced, must stop f uh, leaking into the ground and possibly even contaminating uh, uh, um, water. And the third is the road maintenance. Two, uh, it sounds repetitive, but two thirds of the of the town being the flood plains and landfill, the roads suffer considerably and it's almost impossible to maintain permanently. So it has to be constant maintenance. The hills, as the, the David said, really need. I've been walking the commune in the whole neighborhoods, and they really need the repair as well. Um, I said everything. That's it. Thank you, Valeria. Uh, David, uh, you're going to start off this time. Uh, the question is from the audience, which of your principles or viewpoints differentiates you from the other candidates? So how do you differ from the other candidates? Each candidate will get that same question. Can I have 15 minutes to think about this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, one of the things that's pretty cool about this race is that each of the humans who is running is a pretty good person. Um, and um, I, I would say that I, the best phrase that I've heard tonight is one that Valeria said, which is care comes from the inside, care comes from within. Um, and I think all of us have a degree of care about our community that's going to motivate us to do uh, great things and keep doing great things here. Uh, the, I, I'm not sure that I can point to myself as something that would differentiate me or my principles that would differentiate me, except that I've always been accused of being a highly principled person. My nickname at work is Professor because I'm constantly digging deep, thinking deeper, and then uh, getting to perhaps overly complex uh, solutions. It really is uh, my time in grade and the length of uh, time and the depth of breadth of time in volunteer things, in public policy, in environmental policy, uh, in teaching uh, with, in, in the setting of the uh, Environmental Forum of Marin, right in this room. We've had a few uh, lectures that I have organized on renewable energy and climate change and other topics. Um, so um, it's really just the, uh, I am the one who has actually walked the walk and not just talked the talk. Thank you. Why uh, would be a, a good candidate? Well, 
I come from a small town, not that small actually, in Brazil. And through the years I saw how everything went, uh, how the town, the, the city changed through the lack of care of everybody. I immigrated for love, and then when we decided to move to Corta Madeira, and I saw this, that's where I want to live. That was a choice. I chose this town, and um, the care that comes along with that. So I have 16 years of public service, and I, in, from federal level and state level, I work for the Judicial Council, and I think the public policies development that I've seen in these places and is still working on that, we can translate much better in our small town level here. So that's what the difference I think it is, is the experience from top to bottom. We are going from federal level to here. And am I answering the question? I think I am. <laughs> and 15 seconds. And the genuine care I, I feel for this, for the town we live at. Larry, thank you, Eli. Well, I think all four of us really share Corte Madera's values, and that's been really great to see. It's, it's a pleasure and an honor to be campaigning with you guys, and Bob especially, who uh, is not here tonight. But I really do think we all share the same value set that our community holds dear. Um, I think what differentiates me, in my, uh, in my opinion, from the rest of the field is that I try and take a much longer term view of the issues that Cormodera faces. I can tell you that in serving on the Flood Control Board, I have found that, that that body tends to take about a five to 20 year view of climate change. Uh, we're not really planning so much on the 50 to 100 year time frame. I think that's really critical, especially for a problem like climate change, where the issue is not only accelerating, but it's it's... It's a very long-term issue. We're, we're not really feeling the effects of it yet, but we will. Uh, and we have a chance right now to lay the groundwork for a successful response. That's what I try to bring to the table here, is, is sort of a, a longer-term view of the issues that Corte Madera faces. Thank you. What a refreshing sound to hear four people running for office all respecting each other. This doesn't happen everywhere, you know. <laughs> I know. It comes as a shock to you, I mean. Valeria, next question from the audience. How would you promote and enhance beautification of our town, especially along the 101 corridor? Really? <laughs> well, especially along the 101 corridor. I think they, yes, I think that's, they're emphasizing that there. Okay. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful town, and we would have to have a, a I have no idea. Uh, that's the truth. We can talk about that. If you have ideas, let's talk. Because along the 101 corridor, I don't know. I, I, can't, I can't think. Well, of course, we, ha we can do some renovations in the shoppings, but they are private. We can increase trees. We can do landscaping and get better. I mean, there is always something better we can do along that corridor. It's very dry, very concrete, very gray we can improve in that side to reflect the rest of town. So these would be my ideas. I'm not specialist in that. I want to hear from the community, and I want to talk to those who understand public works and all of this. There is a beautification committee in town, and you've been doing that for quite a long time. Let's talk. I think the amazing natural beauty of Corn Madera is one of our home's biggest strengths. Uh, it's, it's a fantastic thing. There's also a lot of man-made beauty in Corn Madera. I've lived in East Corn Madera my whole life, and I remember when the hanging baskets came to East Corn Madera, and when we were out walking the dog, it just made such a difference. Uh, I think that planting is going to be a key issue uh, in increasing the beautification of Corte Madera, especially along the freeway. I also think that there's sort of a, an opportunity for synergy there. If we conduct these plantings with native species, we can help restore the local ecology that has a lot of times been decimated by development. I think that's an exciting opportunity and I would love to see us uh, take advantage of the opportunity to plant more local plants, local species uh, along the 101 corridor. I also think the idea for a pedestrian and bike overpass over 101 to connect 
uh, the east and west sides of town is a really exciting idea, and I think that could be planted too to great effect. Thank you. Thank you, Eli. David. Yeah, I like the overpass idea too. I'm guessing that I know who wrote this question, uh, who has been uh, keen on cleaning up the 101 Carter. You know, there's a, a jurisdictional question here, and that is Caltrans controls the Carter, right? Uh, so the, there, there are a couple of fences near the beautifully renovated and expanded Nordstrom that are just looking so shabby, but we can't touch those, nor can Nordstrom's, nor can Maserich, the owner of the rest of the mall up there, uh, because Caltrans controls that uh, right away, right, Stan? Uh, so we've got we've to gotta start putting some pressure on Caltrans, and uh, perhaps once... Uh, we're, uh, I'm on the council and work with the uh, Marin uh, Transportation Authority of Marin. Uh, we can put some additional pressure on Caltrans over there and, and really clean up uh, the act along that corridor. But you know, the uh, city of San Rafael also has a beautification committee and they have a, a one Saturday every six months or so when a number of businesses have pulled their volunteers together and they put on all the safety jackets and they go out and clean that roadway, uh, it's necessary. Um, anyway, good question. Thank you, David. Next question here. Are you in, oh, let's see, this is gonna be Eli, by the way, we'll start with Eli. Eli, are you in favor of taxing Airbnbs or the similar with a tax similar to hotels? I will admit that that is not an issue that I have given much thought to yet, so I'm just going to go kind of based on uh, what seems to me to make sense. Uh, I think that taxing Airbnb, I think, makes sense. We've got sales taxes in our town. The idea is that when a financial transaction is conducted, some of that money goes to fund the services that the people of Cordmadera want. So it seems to me that it would be consistent there to also tax uh, Airbnb transactions. I don't know that I would necessarily want to equate that to uh, the taxes that we put on hotels. Hotels are much larger chains. Uh, they have a lot more financial resources. There's, I mean, they're a hotel and an individual renting out a room in their house are two totally incomparable things. Uh, so I, like I said, I, I think that issue certainly warrants uh, more investigation. Uh, I think a tax on Airbnb could indeed make sense. I'm not so sure that a tax on Airbnb that equates to our tax on hotels makes sense. Thank you. I'm sure glad you got that question first, <laughs> because I also have not uh, put much thinking into this. I think that um, I would say, on the other hand, that a you know a a nightly fee is a nightly fee, and there's a market price for a nightly fee, and within that there ought to be some room for um, hotel taxes that can come to the town. Um, I good luck in in uh, putting together the administration that will actually assess that. Uh, I think we'd have to have make sure that we had corporate a, a Airbnbs as opposed to individual style Airbnbs. But you know, out in West Marin, where there are a lot of houses that are purely used as vacation homes, a VRBO. How many people are familiar with VRBO? Vacation rentals by owner, right? VRBO came in and sort of took over the, the landscape. The note, there was another competitor, and now there's yet another that's undercutting VRBO because they're charging too much in service fees. So this is part of our gig economy that is changing every year uh, and altering every year. Just look at the uh, electrified scooters in downtown San Francisco that weren't there a year ago, and now they're all over the place. Uh, so I, I think it would be interesting for us to try to get on top of this and to uh, try to treat it as um, as guest stays, as uh, hotel stays, and uh, see if there's something that is doable there uh, and feasible without adding to too much of the burden of staff in town. Thank you, David. Valeria? I am absolutely pro-charging the transient tax to the Airbnbs in town. We have to regulate that. First, because it, it is not coming out of the pocket of the homeowner, it's coming from the guest. It will be in the tax and the amount he's paying, the, the person he, the person is paying uh, per night to that house. So, it's not coming from you or from me. It's coming, it's already being paid. Second, last time I checked, we had 53 unit uh, uh, properties listed in Airbnb alone, in, in the town in Corte Madeira. 
44 full homes and the, the other nine were rooms. We must tax those staying in these homes to be able to fund at least partially, the affordability we are going to provide in other, in other services to, to the community here. So people from outside will pay this tax. Yes, I am 100% pro that. Thank you, Valeria. Next question, and David, you're going to start this one off. What's your position on the consolidation of services, municipal services, with other <laughs> cities, and what are your suggestions? This is a great question, and um, I think I earned a couple of, um, let's say, um, adversaries here in town. About 18 years ago, I stood up in a meeting, and the town council at that time here said, um, let's have a January session where we just ask for anything, anything at all. And at that time, we had the Twin Cities Police. It wasn't yet Central Marin Police. We didn't have any sharing of fire. We didn't have, share, therefore, sharing of paramedic services. We did have, of course, the schools that were the Larkspur Court of Madera School District. We didn't have any sharing of our uh, rec department. And I stood up um, together with the late Kitty Prosser, who liked the phrase, Corta Malarkey. And I said, you know, all of us who live in Corta Madera could increase our home prices, $50,000 like that, if we renamed our community Larkspur Corta Madera because comparable homes in Larkspur were selling for about that much more. Well, I did take some heat for that, but I've been advocating that the fire departments get together, that the police department complete its uh, uh, allegiance, uh, I mean, uh, uh, its alliances, and the police department saving a million dollars across the three every year. We're saving $750,000 across the fire uh, service after unifying our two towns. And yes, I too was endorsed by the Marine Professional Firefighters Association who feel that their work is that much more professional because they have that much more training in paramedic services, which is the majority of what they do in both of our communities. And so they're, they're feeling a little bit more uplifting um, from that unification. And there is more, there's more room that could be done in, uh, as well. Sorry that we have just a minute. <laughs> Would you repeat the question, please? What is your position on the consolidation of municipal services with other cities, and what are your suggestions? Okay. I like what was done for, with the police and the, and, the, and the fire department. We are saving money doing, doing that. The, the towns are too, too close to each other, and uh, instead of having two chiefs, we have just one. Instead of having paying extra in, in many things and, and so on. Um, no, not getting together in everything, but the way the, the joint agreements and the joint operations that are happening right now, they have my support. The numbers that were presented to me in this process uh, makes lots of sense to the size we are, both Larkspur and Court Madeira. We are saving money. Preempted you there. Uh, I think that consolidating municipal services can be a really powerful tool for us, but it needs to be used on a case by case basis. Uh, we need community buy in whenever we're going to embark on one of these projects. Uh, there are obviously local control issues at hand. Uh, there are issues of whether these different communities have different needs at hand, and those need to be carefully considered. There's also, though, the potential for better service, more amenities at lower cost, and that's really critical for us. When you've got tiny communities like Corte Madera or Larkspur paying for these really big, elaborate services like police departments or fire departments, it costs a lot of money, and you can oftentimes save money without any reduction in the quality of service by consolidating. Uh, I think the Central Marin uh, Police Authority has been a really successful example of this. Uh, the Central Marin Fire Department that's very close to coming together now is so far looking great. Uh, all of the, the firefighters that I've spoken to are thrilled about it. They think that not only is this going to save us money, but it's going to make their jobs easier. It's going to make it easier for them to keep us safe. And that's really critical. So I think consolidating services is absolutely a tool that we should keep in our toolbox, consider it carefully, and use if it's appropriate. Thank you. Can I have 10 more seconds on that question? <laughs> so I finally thought of you can, but then Valeria and, and yes. Eli will yes. have 10 seconds, but only 10. Okay. 
so at, let's add to the list Park and Rec, which is already enjoying some coordination uh, and is very much in parallel to the schools. Uh, let's add libraries. Libraries is a county function. This wonderful Corte Madera Library is a county library. Uh, the library in, in Larkspur uh, needs relocating. There are a lot of opportunities that go beyond what we've mentioned so far. Larry, anything else? No, but about the library. <laughs> uh, our library is right here in the middle of town, in the middle of the town. It serves very well this side and the other side. It's a building, beautiful building, a beautiful place. That's my library. Leave that alone. Eli, any, any th other 10 second thoughts? I stand by my prior statements and I cede my time. Thank you. <laughs> There's a gentleman. Uh, I, we had one question here. I'm going to just ask Larry very briefly because the other two folks have responded to it. And I don't want to waste the time of all. It was just, what's your position on a bicycle connector between East Corner Madera and West Corner Madera? Eli and David commented on it. Do you have a comment on that? I'd like to give you the opportunity. By co a connector. The pedestrian overpass. Yeah. Yes. Well, I, I saw briefly a plan for that about, about the bike and pedestrian overpass connecting the both sides of town. I did, per, it's a personal opinion. I do not have a, a strong technical opinion on that. Personally, I don't think it's going to serve really for, really I'm going to carry your bags from one shop into the other. I don't see that happening exactly. But that's a personal opinion. I need a lot more to give a town council opinion on that. I couldn't, I, I, I would rather not that's fine. go that's, into this. That's a good answer. Uh, <laughs> next question from the audience. Similar to, kind of similar to the one we asked before, but it's a little different approach. I think people are looking for ways to distinguish the candidates. Valero, you'll start. As a, if elected to a member, as a member of the town council, what do you consider your biggest strength? And what do you consider your biggest weakness? Let's start. <laughs> biggest weakness. <laughs> that is the fact I'm an educator. And uh, I will not give you red answers or rehearsed um, statements about anything. I'll talk from my heart. I'll try to inform. Well, that's a, that's a strength. But I will not give you big names and big numbers and be talking like if I understood everything because we, nobody does, actually, nobody does. So I'll be looking for learning what I don't know. I'll be researching, asking those who came before me, asking those who are here longer than I am. Those, that would be, that could probably would be my weakness. I would sound stupid saying, Yes, when everybody says, I really want because this and this. No, I'm not wasting time doing that. My strength, my years in, 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 at public service, I, ha I am a public servant, a public employee at heart. I've seen many things in many levels, and I think I can really translate that experience here. Being a foreigner, being di uh, your diversity, being the only women in the new council, who is going to speak for us? There are many things that just we understand and we can put a, a unique perspective. I have to stop. Thank you, Strength and weakness. I think one of the biggest strengths that I would bring to the town council is the architecture mindset. Uh, one thing that I've noticed is that a lot of architects are interested in politics, or rather not politics, policy. And I think that's because Architecture and politics are sort of similar in a way in that they're both about really taking complex systems, parsing them, figuring out what's going on here, how can I optimize it, and then putting the pieces back together in the way that works best for all the stakeholders. I think that's a strength that I've uh, certainly learned uh, through my time at working in architecture and, and studying architecture, and I look forward to bringing that to the town council. Uh, when it comes to my biggest weakness, I... I totally recognize that I am 25 years old and there is a real connection between age, wisdom, and experience. Uh, <laughs> so I will say that 
I, I am totally cognizant of that, and I am dedicating myself to making sure that I'm learning every step of the way. I've got a big learning curve ahead of me, but I think I've got the energy and the will and the work ethic to do it, and I ask you for that honor. Thank you. Thank you, Eli David. I'm trying to think of what it was that um, uh, Ronald Reagan said. Uh, that what, what, what did Ronald Reagan say <laughs> about age and experience? It was a very clever remark to uh, Walter Mondale. Um, you know, I think that uh, I have been accused of being arrogant. That's a weakness. I've been accused of talking too much. I think that is sometimes a weakness. Uh, tell me more, <laughs> Susie, tell me more. What are my weaknesses? There, I'm sure, put up your hands. There are, there are several of you who know that I have weaknesses. Um, one of my strengths, however, I think is networking. And I have a, a, a very good and deep list of friends and uh, allies and uh, in, in the context of the Lions Club here, uh, I think I was very good at delegating and recognizing talent and bringing people in and up and, and getting things happening. We had during the during the bicentennial, I'm sorry, the centennial year, uh, which uh, Becky was chairing, we had about six different events where we had more than two dozen, sometimes more than three dozen of Lions contributing to that community event. Uh, and that's the kind of thing that I, uh, I have been able to do successfully and uh, bring to bear uh, and would hope that um, I could uh, do that further. Another is, I think, vision. I, I too, went to uh, urban planning school in the last century and uh, being able to visualize what really works for people is something that I think I can do very well. Thank you, David. We're going to wind down here with questions, and then we have a couple of them, and I'm going to try to paraphrase them. Uh, and uh, uh, Valeria, you'll be the first person to respond to this. Really relates to what are your thoughts about traffic uh, and mobility in, in, in Corte Madera. Uh, with the limitations of the current level of public transit, uh, with freeway congestion, but with changes coming, like the autonomous car, uh, what do you see as suggestions you would make to facilitate mobility in Corte Madera? I don't know if I'm going to be too popular, but I defend transit, public transit, immensely. And I think it should have connection both sides of town by public transit. We do not use because it's not there. The 22 that serve this side of town, one hour waiting, if you miss one, you have to wait for a full hour for another one. I advocate for smaller, green buses, reducing the emissions, reducing the noise. If our teenagers and children know they can do things and go place to place by public transit, they will use it. If they use it in different places, why they are not going to use it in Corte Madeira? They will. So we have to work together with the, the Golden Gate Transit and the Marine Transportation Authority in order to go and, and make sure they understand that ridership in a big bus that runs hourly, yes, is always going to be a problem. They cannot me measure it the, the way the system is. So um, I would love to see less cars and less emissions and less noise, I think, would benefit all of us in general. And the, the transportation, if you consider the roads, I consider that a triad, the transit, the, tra the transportation, the traffic. Uh, if you take care of the roads and if you diminish the number of, of cars in the roads, traffic will be taken care of as well. So it's a chain of things that we can do together to, to, to be better in that area. I think there are work to be done. And Peter Brown, current staff, is a specialist in it. If I heard you correctly, it sounded like part of that question was sort of the assumption of given the limits of our current public transit situation. I personally would reject that assumption. I don't think that the current public transit that we offer is acceptable. I think there's a lot of improvements that need to be made, and they can be as simple as just synchronizing the schedules of different modes of public transit. I can tell you I take the ferry to work, and if you want to t pair the ferry with a bus, you're in for a very long commute. Uh, so. I think that there's a, a lot of steps that we could take to improve public transit. I also think we're in a tough spot because I think all of us can sense that transit transportation is on the precipice of huge shifts right now, both from gas-powered cars to electric vehicles uh, and also autonomous vehicles. Uh, I think that the challenge for us right now is going to be to 
work to alleviate the traffic that we're currently suffering from, but not put all of our eggs in one basket without, real, without fully understanding the direction that transit is going in. Uh, I believe that Cordmandera is fully capable of doing this. We have a lot of expertise in the community. Uh, we'll be working together with other local municipalities. Uh, I think this is the sort of long-term approach that we need to take to this issue. Thank you. I'm so glad to hear both uh, Valeria and Eli talk about the virtues of transit, and I would uh, celebrate that as well. My, uh, our 18-year-old doesn't drive, doesn't own a cell phone, and she uses the bus all, all the time. We have in, improved the Marin Transit service quite a bit, and we have improved its timeliness quite a bit, and its service to the school community quite a bit. That can be improved still further. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed in town, has anybody else noticed that how much better the traffic gets when school's on vacation? And have you noticed how much worse it gets during the winter holiday season, the shopping season? So all we have to do is cancel Christmas and close the public schools, right? Then our transportation would be just fine. Uh, before autonomous vehicles come into play, electric vehicles are here and gaining ground, and we've got to have... Uh, more supports in town. This is actually an infrastructure answer. We got to have more supports for electrifying and charging uh, electric vehicles because they are here. They, uh, Volvo has already said all of their future vehicles are going to be uh, electric or hybrid. Uh, other thing, other uh, cities and countries have said we're going to end the internal combustion engine. We got to work towards that end, and we can increase mobility with uh, uh, transportation as a service. I don't like it myself, but we can do that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, David. Diane, would you please come back to the table? And since we are going to conclude right now and have uh, folks uh, give us a little summary and uh, thoughts on uh, how they should vote come election, since uh, we started with uh, Bob Ravasio and Diane going last, we're going to start with them. Diane, would you read Bob's statement, please? Bob Ravazio is running to maintain his seat on the Corte Madera Town Council this June. He is committed to our community, its small town character, strong values, caring residents, and good schools. He would be honored to serve another term. There are many important priorities to be addressed over the next few years on behalf of our town and its residents. Bob is prepared to protect and enhance our community by working to maintain the attributes that brought each of us here. He hopes to earn your vote to continue as a council member. If you will read through Bob's website at www.retainravaziotowncouncil.com, you will learn more about him, the important priorities and issues he will continue to work on as a council member, and see the many people and organizations who support his efforts to enable Corte Madera to thrive and maintain its quality of life. Please vote to retain Bob Ravazio on the town council on June 5th, and I will repeat that website one more time, www.retainravaziotowncouncil.com, and there's also some materials uh, from Bob's campaign on the table in the side room. Vice Mayor Diane, first, thank you for ably representing Bob Ravazio tonight. Valeria Sasser, please. Thank you for the opportunity to addressing all of you tonight. It's good to see a quite full room here. Um, thank you for listening to my ideas and to our common unity, to our common ideas for our town and all, all that we can do together. Inclusion, diversity of voices, connection to our community values are paramount to build on the good work of Red on Way in Corta Madeira to review and improve what can be improved and to take our town to a brighter future. I count on your vote and support to help me exercise our shared community values at the Court Madeira Town Council. I plan to keep the communication open. My website, my email will remain the same and I really hope to connect and contact and talk to everyone that I can in this town. If you give me a vote on June 5th, I have literature outside in my website. I was not planning for that. The website is www.valeriasasser4cortemadeira.com. Um, I hope to hear from you. Thank you very much. Valeria Sasser, thank you.
David Kuhnhart. Thank you very much to the chamber and uh, to all of you for coming out tonight. Really appreciate it. You can tell about a lot about our respective experience from uh, this evening, but I'm going to like to engage with you a little bit on how it's going to work. From me, you will always get straight answers. You will get engagement, especially in the big issues. You are also going to uh, receive encouragement from me to engage in the civic process, especially if you do it in a civil fashion. You will always get respect from me for you and for due process. I'm going to mention those who have endorsed me, not because we live in a top-down world, but because we, uh, you can count on me to know where to go when we need help outside our town boundaries, and we will need help from others. We're not isolated. Uh, we will need collaboration from others out in the county and around. I've been endorsed by Congressman Jared Huffman and his district senior aide by the Democratic Party. I've been endorsed by Senator Mike McGuire by Assembly Member Mark Levine and by their respective staff. I've been endorsed by the Mill Valley Mayor uh, Stephanie Moulton Peters, who is also chair now of the Transportation Authority of Marin, which is going to affect all of us. I've been endorsed by Supervisor Junior Arnold, and I'm working very closely with other members of the Board of Supervisors on Drawdown Marin in particular. None of this is as important as you, my friends because you're the actual voters, because the just powers are derived from the consent of the governed. So that's, in, that's actually in our, in our Declaration of Independence. So I'm asking you for your consent, your support, and your vote. Thank you very much. And look at KuhnhartforCouncil.org. KuhnhartforCouncil.org. David simple. Kuhnhart, thank you. Eli Beckman, please. Thank you very much, and thank you all again for coming out here. Uh, Corte Madera is my hometown, so I care really deeply about what happens here. I'm running for town council because I see a moment of opportunity for our town, and I want to have a hand in setting our town up for a secure and prosperous future. I take a long-term approach to the issues that our town faces, like climate change, online retail, and the immense pressure on our town to grow. I think we need to manage that carefully. I'm honored to be endorsed by the Marin Independent Journal, the Central Marin Police Officers Association, the Marin Professional Firefighters, Assemblyman Mark Levine, Supervisor Dennis Redoni, our mayor and our vice mayor, and many other respected members of our community who are here with us tonight. If you vote for me, I promise you that I will dedicate all of my energy and all of my effort to serving you well. Campaigning has been a fantastic experience for me. I've already visited the homes of more than 3,000 voters, and I can't wait to continue all the way through Election Day. It's been so great to meet everybody and get such a fantastic cross-section of the community. I've, I've had such a good time meeting all these people who have been my neighbors for my whole life, and I've, I'm only now just getting the chance to meet everyone. It's been so rewarding, uh, and that is why I respectfully ask for your vote. Thank you very much. Good night. What can you say? This is a great group. Uh, Eli, David, Valeria, and for Bob, pass on. You know, it takes uh, uh, something for people to stand up and actually put themselves before the community. Candidate development is a very difficult part of the process. Corner Madera is very fortunate to have excellent qualified candidates. There's some towns in Marin this year that do not have candidates. It doesn't necessarily mean that everybody's happy with everything that's going on. It means that here you have a, viled, a valid, vital community center and a community uh, culture, if you will. So you're a compliment, and you folks coming tonight are a compliment to make this whole process work. So I wish you all well on election night, which is coming up pretty soon. The ballots are out there, or the absentees are out there and today. More people vote by mail than they vote in person. So thank you all for coming, and a final word. Corte Madera voters, you have a tough job ahead of you. We have four amazing candidates. Uh, we have three positions to fill, so please vote. Um, we have some thank yous tonight. Uh, first and foremost, of course, our four wonderful candidates. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> we, 
we were so fortunate to have uh, Dick Spotswood here tonight as our moderator. So. And just if the people who work behind the scenes uh, to make this happen. Uh, first, first and foremost, um, Julie Kritzberger, the, the chamber exec. Thank, thank you, Julie. <laughs> Our timekeeper tonight, Bill Hester. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> I want to thank the uh, Corte Madera Rec Department for the use of uh, this beautiful room tonight. Um, the camera guys, I believe uh, this will this will be on the town's website very soon. If you want to uh, want to rerun, you can you can check it out. And if, for people who didn't come tonight, please tell them that they can they can check this out again on, on the town website. Uh, and I want to thank the audience for your wonderful questions. We weren't able to get to all of them, but thank you for a wonderful evening. Uh, please vote, and um, thank you for your support. Good night, everybody. Thank you.